So in 2009, Nikos and his colleagues published an important paper, which I think is an important paper, which has not been as noticed as it should be, namely that they took area V1, the primary visual cortex in the macaque, and lesioned a part of it, um, and recorded it from a part of V2, which receives an input from V1. Now, the important thing there is that they discovered that the cells of V2, which were always thought to receive their input from V1, were perhaps not as vigorous and robust in their activity, but they then nevertheless responded. Uh, their responses, their receptive fields were in the correct part. Now, I'm terribly sorry that this slide is not bigger, uh, in the correct part, and that they, ha they were they had the property of orientation selectivity, which is a critical property in the visual cortex. And so the implication was that the traditional view that all the visual signals go to the primary visual cortex, which Paul Flexig called an interesting description, said the, the sole entering place of the visual radiation into the organ of psyche. Uh, they all go into the primary visual cortex, and from the primary visual cortex go to the other areas beyond. And there were good reasons for supposing that, and I'm, I apologize for those who, who know all of this stuff, and namely, one of the powerful reasons was that damage to the primary visual cortex, whether it was total or partial, led to a corresponding uh, uh, inability to see in the relevant part of the field of view, what's known as a, a homeanopia or a scotoma or, uh, uh, or a, a quadrantinopia. So that was one reason. Um, then there was, of course, the physiological evidence which showed that the receptive fields of cells became larger as you progressed from V1 to V2 to V4 or to other areas. They were suggesting a sort of a hierarchical progression. And so the general picture was of a retina projecting to LGN, projecting to primary visual cortex, and then uh, in, a, in a serial way projecting to other areas with an, an area X being the possible center where you, you perceive things. Now, for those who may not have seen this, I exclude turnium option in this. Uh, I'm showing you a, a orientation selective cell because it's a, quite a critical property of the, of the primary visual cortex. Indeed, the orientation selective cells are elaborated in the primary visual cortex, or so it is imagined, um, and then uh, conveyed to other areas. So this is a cell in the primary visual cortex. Uh, I don't know whether we've got sound. Do we have sound? Do we have sound? No. Very, very old recording. So, the evidence that Nikos and his colleagues corrected suggested that maybe orientation selective cells are separately built up from uh, the inputs from elsewhere, not from the lateral genicular, uh, not from the primary visual cortex. Now, since the discovery of parallel outputs from the primary visual cortex to different areas, uh, the picture was modified, so that it was not strictly serial, but hierarchical, uh, sorry, not strictly serial, but parallel. However, the primary visual cortex was still considered to be the sole entering place into the rest of the visual brain. In spite of the fact that Brian Craig in 1969 and, and, and Benevento in the 1970s, and, and Evi uh, in, in 1980, and Wolfgang Fries in 1980, had shown that there are direct inputs from the lateral genicular nucleus to the areas, the visual areas lying outside the primary visual cortex. So, the other point which was, I think, implicitly made, not explicitly, but implicitly, 
in phrases such as the, uh, how we see simultaneously color, form, and motion, is that the input was through v, retina, LGN, V1, and then these areas, but the, that the activity in all these areas occurred simultaneously. So that is sort of picture which we need to uh, look at a bit more carefully. And one thing which uh, uh, Yoshihito Shigihara and I did was to take orientation oriented lines, uh, combine them into angles and combine them into rhombuses, and look at two things with magnetoencephalography and functional magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, whether, what were the latencies of the responses in the different visible areas, especially the ones which are acknowledged to have high concentrations of orientation selective cells, and whether it is true that perhaps um, uh, angles will, as had been claimed, angles would activate areas outside V1 more strongly and lines would activate V1 more strongly. It turned out that, first of all, all these areas, the V1, V2, V3, uh, receive, uh, have a fast input. I'm not going to talk about these latency, these uh, long latency inputs, but the short latency one here, a fast short latency input corresponding to about 40 milliseconds. And this is true to, of all of these areas, V1 and the others. And it turns out as well that the most potent stimulus for stimulating all these areas, and I'm terribly sorry that the lighting is rather poor here, so you've got to go by more by your auditory systems uh, than the visible one. Um, the angles were the most powerful stimulus compared to the rhombuses and the uh, lines for all of them. Again, in a way, lending support to, to something which we have perhaps ignored, that maybe there are other potent inputs to visual areas outside the primary visual cortex, whose role is not known, but it would be surprising if they were just there for, for as a backup system or for some uh, cotton wool plugs. Now, um, if you look at, uh, sorry, if th that is for, for form, for orientation, if you look at color, so if you have a stimulus, as again with Yoshida Shigihara, again, you cannot see this, but essentially uh, you have a stimulus which changes in color uh, from gray to red, red to blue, blue to red, and so on. And again, you find that there is an initial, very f short latency response which occurs uh, below, 40, below 50 milliseconds, roughly at about 43 milliseconds. So that the color system, just like the form system, is recipient of a very fast input, in addition, of course, to the input from the primary visual cortex. And if you look at the, what are known as the higher visual areas, such as uh, houses and faces, so if you construct houses and faces from lines, because the general thinking is that uh, it is from lines that, that faces and houses are elaborated. By the way, nobody has ever succeeded in showing how this is done. But if you read papers on face physiology, and face perception, face fMRIs, you find, I have not read all of them, but I have read a sufficient number to know that they all believe, all of them without exception, that it is, it's all starts in V1 and no, uh, possibility, no credit is given to perhaps uh, inputs from outside V1. So if you look at uh, uh, faces and houses constructed from straight lines, which subjects can easily distinguish, then there's again this activity here, early uh, short latent response below 50 milliseconds. And uh, again, uh, the, the, the lighting is too bad for me f to, sh to point this out to you. But in, in regions which are accepted to be uh, critically involved in the perception of faces and houses, such as the occipital face area, the parahippocampal, sorry, parahippocampal face area, and the uh, fusiform face area. And this is more of the same, so I need not show you that. So all of this should not have come as a major surprise. Because in 1917, a century ago, in the aftermath of the Great War, 
George Riddick in London had examined the, the, the uh, vision of patients who had been blinded uh, by enemy fire and found that the, in the hemianopic fields they could detect motion, nothing else but motion. And he wrote, and I quote, he said, uh, they can either ascribe, they cannot ascribe either uh, color or form to it, so shadowy is the motion. They can only ascribe motion, all right? And this, in, in a hemianopic patient, seemed extraordinary and therefore was quickly dismissed, actually for not such bad reasons by, by, by Gordon Holmes, and I would not go into that evidence now. But it turned out since then that there is an area here a V5 or MT, as it is more often known as, um, which, in which cells are uh, predominantly orient, uh, direction selective. They respond to motion of uh, stimuli in, uh, in one direction and not in the other. And I suggested that it is perhaps that, that input to, these, uh, to this area in particular that uh, mediates this conscious perception of motion Riddick used the term conscious five times in his paper. And so it should not have been surprising then that uh, in 1960, uh, sorry, in 1993, when I published a paper with Barber and John Watson saying that there is conscious vision in the absence of V1, it was conscious motion vision, that should not have been so surprising because they had the precedence of George Riddick, but you also had the precedence of the work of Brian Cragg and Evi and Mishkin, but also on top of that, you had the experiments of uh, Rodman and uh, Albright, who had shown that when you damage V1 in the macaque monkey, you still get directionally selective cells with the appropriate receptive fields, just as the experiments of uh, Nikos and his friends have shown for the form system. Now, it turns out, so the most famous subject, this is the phenomenon known as blind sight. Now, blind sight is not something I agree with. Blind sight says that you, uh, subjects who are blinded by lesions in V1 can discriminate correctly to high levels, 90%, the direction of motion of stimuli, but have no acknowledged awareness of that having seen anything. This is not my experience. My experience of the same patient is that they are able to see fast motion, to report this direction, and therefore they are conscious of fast motion, and they are not able to see slow motion. And I think the point I have tried to make has been conceded by the simple expedient of dividing blind sight into two components, blind sight one, and blind sight two. Blind sight two corresponds to the Riddick syndrome, in which they are conscious of having seen motion. So I rest my case. So let's go on. So this is subject GY. This is his blind field, uh, sustained because of, a, uh, because of a lesion sustained at the age of seven. We examined him at the age of 32, so many years after he had his uh, uh, damage, and found that he was able to see and, and report the, uh, the direction of motion, provided they were fast-moving stimuli. And in subsequent experiments that I did with Georg Beckers and with Dominic Fitch and Chris Guy, uh, it, it turns out that there are really two pathways to, the, to area V5, the motion selective area. One which delivers signals at between 32 and, and as between 28 and 32 milliseconds, faster than anything ever reported before. And another one which delivers things at 74 milliseconds. The fast one bypasses V1, the primary visual cortex. The slow one goes through V1. And here is a recording again. Uh, well, let me just, uh, not since I'm afraid you're not going to see it, there's no point um, uh, trying to use the slide. The, the fast stimuli go first to V1, and the slow stimuli go first to V5. And so, you have now to change the picture. Now, I'll come back to the necessity for doing that, because there's no absolute necessity. You've got to change the picture to, to, of the connections of the, uh, of the organization of inputs to the visible brain by saying that there are uh, uh, inputs from the retina 
to the pulvinar, to the LGN, from these two structures to all of these areas. But the input depends, the, the primacy or the, the latency of the input is dependent upon the characteristics of the stimulus. If the stimulus is a fast one, at more than 20, moving at more than 20 degrees per second, the input is to V5 first. If it's a slow one, then the input is to V1. Is that going? Uh, goes to V1 first. So there's a dynamic parallelism in the uh, sequence with which signals reach the visual brain. And of course, you begin to ask the question, well, the primary visual cortex, in terms of fast motion signals, uh, it is, they reach V5 first, so maybe that is the primary visual brain in terms of fast motion. Now, um, what is this? Oh, yes. So if you, if you have a, 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 if you take the subject, if you take the subject who's blind, lesion in V1, and show him fast moving stimuli, he is conscious of them. In other words, he tells you which direction they're moving in, provided they're fast moving and high contrast. And you get activity in V5, again, no point showing it. And if you uh, show him slow moving stimulus, stimuli, uh, less than five degrees per second, he is neither conscious of them nor can he discriminate them, and you get no activity in V5. Therefore, the direct input from the lateral geniculate nucleus to uh, V5 can elicit a conscious visual experience without the participation of V1. Now, this made it interesting to, uh, to reconsider another experiment which I had done years before of using uh, the Isia Levian illusion where you see fast motion in these, some of you see, will see fast motion in these rings, but you can't see it here, alas. Um, and it turns out that when you, uh, people who see this fast motion in the rings have got activation in V5, again, you can't see it. You, it's all the blind leading the blind here, isn't it? Uh, so I can tell you anything I want. <laughs> um, and whereas when you've got, uh, these same people are exposed to slow motion, they get activity in V1 and in V5. So when they look at, when they see these rings, you have activity in V5 alone and not in V1. You have to take my word for that. So we have then a situation in which retina, LGN, V1, V1 being the sole output, but we're going to be changing that. But these areas have got a conscious output. They don't ha depend upon V1 if you can channel input directly into them. What is this now? Something else which is new. Oh, right. So here we go. Pulvinar. Uh, ret uh, retina, pulvinar, and LGN, and input to these areas. Now, Bob Wirt and his colleagues, um, Berman, Berman and Wirt, in 2011, showed that the direction selectivity is probably not conferred by the pulvinar input to V5. And uh, uh, Sinsich and his colleagues in 2005, I think, showed that this, that property of directional selectivity is conferred by direct LGN input to V5. So let's go on. So here is an experiment by, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting experiment by Sinsich and his colleagues who injected uh, V5 with um, uh, the uh, cholera, cholera toxin and injected V1 with with the, the, the HRP. Again, you cannot see it, but it turns out that the direct inputs for, to, from the LGN to V5 come from the uh, conucellular layers, and um, they constitute about 10% of the input that comes from uh, uh, the LGN, which is still a significant number. We make it, uh, Stuart Ship and I, make it that the number of per, per percentage of cells in the primary visual cortex from layer 4B that project to V5, let's say LGN, retina, sorry, retina, LGN, V1, V1 to V5, 
and therefore be there about 5%. So 5% of the cells in uh, V1 can confer or help confer certain directional selective properties on uh, V5. So let me then uh, go to another perceptual story, which is, so you've got dual inputs. Uh, three, three feet forward input. So when you read, when you read about the, the feet forward input, it is incorrect. It's incomplete. There are three feet forward inputs. One is through the LGN. One is through the pulvinar, and so, uh, and the other one is through V1. Now, if you, given that V5 receives these very fast signals. Uh, 28 to 32 milliseconds, you would suppose intuitively that you see motion before you see color. And Konstantinos Mutusis and I wanted to, to uh, uh, test that, not in the context of uh, anything else but the binding problem. Because we always say, and you can see it in many papers, there's a mystery of the brain of how we uh, process these different attributes in different areas, yet see everything in precise temporal and spatial registration. And yet nobody, after 50 years of brilliant experimentation, nobody has solved the binding problem. So the question that Konstantinos and I were, were trying to address is, does binding really occur? And what we did was to get a stimulus like this, uh, well, red moving up, and uh, sorry, a stimulus moving up and down, and can be red or green as moved up and down. And the task of the subject is to tell you what the color wall when it was moving up, uh, or conversely, what the direction of motion was when it was green, say. And it turns out, if you do this experiment, and it has been repeated many times, it turns out that the uh, subjects perceive the color, the color 80 milliseconds before they perceive the direction of motion. Now, 80 milliseconds is a very, very long time in terms of neurophysiology because it takes half a millisecond or to one millisecond for the uh, nervous uh, impulse to cross from one cell to the other. So this is a significant difference, but it has also implications. You become aware because you have to name the color. You become aware of the color uh, 80 milliseconds before the direction of motion, which implies that consciousness is not this unified the unified concept, conception of the world, but uh, uh, consciousness of the world, but consciousness is so fractionated that you become conscious of, of, uh, of different visual attributes at different times, and they are processed in different places. Now, Bedell and his uh, colleagues, I think it's his, I don't know, uh, have shown that if instead of saying well, what was green when it was going up or red when it was going down, you are you are asked to say whether the change in color and the change in the direction of motion occurred simultaneously. And if you do ask that question, you find there is no asynchrony at all. They see it both at the same time. So already you can see that there is, uh, it's, it is a bit dependent upon the task you give and also on the stimulus. And uh, I'll escape that. So um, then um, uh, Holcomb and Kavanaugh, have shown that, in fact, you can influence the, the per, uh, perceptual asynchrony by introducing an exogenous uh, attentional stimulus, by, by ringing the stimulus. And then the, the, the asynchrony is considerably diminished, uh, if not abolished. So it turns out, then, that the perceptual asynchrony is dependent upon the stimulus and the task. And this leads me to give you the final summary of the way in which I envisage that the visual brain is organized. So let me just go back to the 1980s and also 2019. Input from the retina to the LGN, LGN to V1. All the properties of stimulus are elaborated from this input from V1 but especially of form and color. If we look at the third one, motion, that was compromised in uh, 1993 because of the demonstration that subjects can perceive uh, direction of motion 
without V1 can perceive, when I say perceive, I mean consciously perceive, um, to the picture of today, which I think is as follows. You have got input from the retina to the LGN to the pulvinar, and then you have got uh, these other areas. Uh, uh, well, these other areas becoming active in a certain succession which is dependent upon time and dependent upon stimulus and dependent upon task. So that the idea that we see everything simultaneously is wrong uh, for all attributes because it depends upon the task and the stimulus. The idea that things are channeled straight uh, only through V1 is wrong because the anatomical demonstration by UKA and EY and Fries and Craig and Benevento and many others. And so I think maybe we should consider revising our opinion of how the visible brain is organized. This, uh, certainly the idea that there's a single feed forward input is fallacious. Now, I might say, I might say that you can ignore all of this because a lot of very good work has been done uh, on form perception, on face perception, etc. Excellent work, without taking any of this into account. And none of this work has to be revised except the interpretation. Certainly, all the, all the interpretations given of face perception, which are all based on the fact that everything depends upon the orientation selective cells of V1, is probably wrong. Um, but the work itself is, is not wrong. And I think that we have to reassess what the contribution of these, of these uh, subcortical inputs in the way that, that, uh, that, that, that Bob Wirtz and, and, uh, and his colleagues and, and Schmidt and his colleagues have done, uh, relative contributions of the genicular input and the pulvinar input to these areas. Um, uh, but otherwise, I think you can carry on with impunity, except, except if you think of what happened to two theories which ignored all of this. One is the theory of blindsight, which was very significantly compromised, very significantly compromised, and if you need any evidence of that, you can find it in the subdivision of the term blindsight into blindsight one and blindsight two, thereby conceding that you can have a, a, a perception which is conscious through the direct input from the LGN without a participation of V1. That's been significantly compromised. The other theory, which has been significantly compromised, perhaps fatally compromised, is the notion that it is the return projections from the specialized areas to V1 that confers the conscious status on a stimulus. That is gone because that may be very important, I'm not denying that, but it is not mandatory, it's not essential, because with a, a V5, which is deafferented from V1, but still receives an input from the LGN, you uh, have subjects with perfectly good conscious vision. So the chairman is my story. Thank you very much, and thank you all for very... Oh, there are two other things which I meant to say but I forgot. <laughs> <laughs>
I just don't understand. It's a massive nucleus, the biggest ceramic nucleus. It's got a massive projection. Uh, maybe Bob Wurtz can, uh, because that's the, the, the clearest distinction of the, uh, I mean, the work of Berman and Wurtz, the clearest distinction between the input from the pulvinar and from the LGN, the input from the LGN confers the property of directional selectivity. The one from the pulvinar is much more concerned with eye movement. So I'm sorry, I cannot. cannot I would add just very quickly, uh, there's also, in terms of deciphering the layers, the uh, MT feedback to V1 is, as, as you had reported, uh, you have odd layer one. The fovea ignores layer one whereas the periphery goes to layer one. So you begin to see a possibility of an interaction of the, of the two things. But we can talk later. Yeah, okay. What will happen? Um, if, is it possible that B5 gets uh, stronger inputs when um, the person is blind? And I would also like to know, me meaning that B5 starts taking somehow the role of B1 when the person is blind. And I would also like to know whether there's a difference between person, a person that is blind since they are born uh, with a person that is blind, that when they acquire over time, is there a difference in the activity of B5? And also, more as a curiosity, what will happen if a human has lesions, lesions all around uh, the visual cortex but uh, B1? Is that person still blind or is that person still able to uh, detect yeah, I think the, the latter question, I think that Mort Mishkin and his colleagues did that, but I can't remember the result. I don't know what anybody else does. And it was some years ago. It was quite a, a, a splendid experiment, but I can't really remember the result. On the question, the first question, the, uh, the patient I examined, GY, uh, was some 28 years after he had sustained that, but not from birth. And I have examined since other patients, because the whole edifice of blindsight was based on this one subject, you see. So I've examined other patients who have sustained their lesion much more recently, and uh, there's not much difference between them, as far as I can tell. But, you know, in 40 years' time, all these things will be regarded as very crude experiments as, as, as the techniques develop. Now, on the question of whether V5 can take over the functions of V1, if it can, it does so in a very trivially, because these subjects are blind. They are not able to see forms. Uh, you also have, of course, the, the reverse situation in which uh, people who are blinded by lesions in V1 can see colors and can see forms, but I have not gone into that today because it's not enough time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.